I'm going to talk about the greater profit in the present financial markets. Why am I going to do that? Well, there's actually Can you speak up, please? There's actually been a very big discussion on the rate of profit in the US. And the strange thing is that most of the Marxists who have previously insisted that the decline in the rate of profit is a sign of the difficulties of capitalism have now begun to produce a lot of evidence which they claim shows that the profit rate is rising. You will see this from the works of Duminil and Levy, of Simon Moen, of um, Bellamy and Foster, the social structures of accumulation people, to a lesser extent mostly. There's quite a wide range of people saying the rate of profit in the US is falling, is rising. Only a small number of people have maintained that it's falling. Essentially, there may be others that I've not noticed, Mosley is a sort of middle case, but myself and Andrew Kleinman, in works published on the Marxist Humanist site, and also in his book, A Crisis of Production, based on reasoning of what is called the Temporal Symbol System Interpretation of Marx, and Robert Brenner, based on a weight of empirical evidence. As far as I know, we're the only people who say it's been falling. Yet everybody's discussing it, and not just the people who want to go around defending Marx. So what's this about? It's not about what I think it was Michael Keane has, du has, has dubbed zombie Marxism. The attempt to go and look at the works of Marx and extract biblical truth from them. Something which I have frequently been accused of, but I hope I could establish I have never done. It's not about the pugnacious lawsuit King Andrew Kleiman or the Antichrist Alan Freeman and their endless war to rescue Marx. It's actually a surrogate debate about the US economy. Because what's happening is the US economy is Marxism is saddled with a theory that tells you the US was doing wonderfully in two th until 2008. Everything was fixed till along came neoliberalism. Some even maintain it still is. The US is top dog, most advanced capitalist economy in the world, the hegemonic power, etc., etc. It's, it's almost like Radica talked about this a lot, and you'll read about it in the book. It's a shibboleth, an almost unquestioned truth of Marxism that the US occupies almost the same role of dominance in the world economy as the UK did in the heyday of the period. It's also the problem is, it's actually been in long-run decline since the 1970s. Now, if you look at any other indicator except the rate of profit, I'm not going to give you the numbers here, but you can look at capacity, unemployment, if you look at um, GDP, if you do a cyclic analysis, if you look at investment, there is practically no, actually the only indicator which suggests an improvement is the rate of profit. And if you read the paper on which this is based, which was published in the Journal of Australian Political Economy, you'll see all those arguments, which I'm not going to repeat here. And as Radic has pointed out, actually the US never was. Not only is the US not what it used to be, as Daniel Ankalu has coined the phrase, it never was anyway. So the only indicator of health is the rate of profit. So the question then is, is it being measured in such a way that it really tells us what we want to know? And what I mean by properly is not in the correct Marxist way. I just mean, are we, as scientists, interrogating the right variable to tell us what the economy is doing? And I looked first at the strange case of the UK profit rate. Why? Because when you test a scientific theory, you have to test it on the most difficult cases and not the most easy cases. What's happening in the UK, if you calculate the profit rate in the way that pretty well all these guys do, no exceptions, minor variations, you'll see a blue line and a black line, it falls until 1973, and then with Maggie Thatcher it recovers, and it goes up ever since. Something strike you as a bit funny about that? Well, the actual state of the UK economy, I don't even know to go through it. I mean, with the US there's a debate. If somebody wants to stand up and say that the UK economy is doing well, I welcome your intervention, but I don't believe you. <laughs> it's up to you, because we've no longer got an idea that this is top dog. That's not at stake anymore. Why does this matter? Because either, in the case of the UK, you have to conclude the profit rate is not an indicator of the health of the economy. 
Because the profit rate, the worse the British economy gets, the more the profit rate rises. That can't be. Or you're not measuring the profit rate in such a way that you actually allows you to understand what's going on. But, so the question is, there's two ways that people approach this. One group of people say, what's the right measure of wages? And there is a huge debate about that. Do you exclude or include supervisory workers? Should you exclude social benefits, etc.? Andrew's book, Crisis of Production, um, which some would call pugnacious, has posed this question with a, you know, a rigorous examination of the facts. I actually don't need to enter into that dispute. I have great sympathy with Andrew's facts because I'm a follower of facts. I'm, I'm a Galilean. I say, look at the facts first, then think about your theory. But actually, oh, and what is the right measure of profit? Whether you measure profits, not the rate of profit, just profits before tax or after, with or without the financial sector, the corporate sector, whole, whole economy, etc. That's all the numerator and the rate of profit. But the key thing about the rate of profit is the denominator. It's capital. So what about capital? Well, there are two sets of arguments that I want to consider. The first is the arguments that Andrew Kleiman and I have advanced, and which so far nobody has refuted, despite many attempts and long arguments, that if you measure the way that Marx intended capital, including fixed assets, you actually find that the rate of profit is not rising in the US as many claim. I want to add to that the second argument, which is, I think, something that has been missed out of the rate of profit. And that is money. That's the argument. I'm going to do this first for the UK, then for the US. This is not in contradiction with what I myself adhere to, as well as Andrew Kleiner, that there is a problem with the way that most Marxists calculate the value of fixed assets. But it's actually complementary to it. And in fact, you can agree with me on number two, even if you don't agree on number one. So there you are. I can buy into my argument about money, even if you don't buy into my zombie Marxism. Now, all Marxists, in the way that the rate of profit is calculated, in all the traditional measures, they treat capital as fixed assets, machinery and buildings and so on. But for Marx, capital is all commodities including money. Why is that important? Because Marx's analysis of crisis begins from the fact that sale and purchase are separate acts. This is his dispute with Say, and from that he concludes that crisis is inherent in capitalism because at that, if that sale and purchase are broken, capital accumulates in the form of money. Pools of money accumulate. That's what happens, that's what a crisis is, no matter what the cause. That is the phenomenal form of crisis. Now, what has happened to the way that money exists in the modern economy? It exists in the form of financial assets. Mainly, it's not gold stuck under the bed. It's not a private deal with the banker of a loan which you cannot alienate. It's marketable assets that yield a return on capital. That is money. This is not about the banks, this is about money. So why don't we look at that money and add that into the denominator and the rate of profit? Do that. First of all, how much of it is there? Well, this is what the UK capitalists were actually doing between about, uh, we've lost the years as well as losing the order of logic, but this is between about 1980 and 2000. It's, it's, it's basically risen um, at a rate that is four or five times the rate of accumulation of fixed assets. And it is now, in fact, 80% of all the assets accumulated by the capitalist class between 1980 and 2010 were financial assets in the UK. It's a phenomenal number. I may have got that wrong. You have to go back to my article, but it's way above 50%. The majority of accumulation in a big way. What happens if we take those assets and by the way, my calculation is a very cautious one. I only put in monetary assets with medium term or longer term. Don't put short term assets, don't put money, don't put hot money in the markets. Just, you know, stuff that you'd say, well, maybe I'll buy a factory or maybe I'll buy a bond. That sort of stuff. That is the corrected UK profit rate. Okay? The blue line is the traditional calculation, and the black line is the corrected calculation. This fixes the UK. What happens if we do the same for the US? The thin black line is the traditional rate of profit. The thick black line 
is the corrected rate of profit. That is when financialization began. That's what happened. People started putting their capital into money instead of assets. Financialization was not a new phenomenon. It was a simple working out of the old, it was a metastasis of the old cancer. Now, those of you who've been following an interesting discussion about the paper by Rogoff and Reinhardt, well, you know, um, they got a 90% correlation. They were wrong. I just tested this on a simple exponential decline. You get an R squared of 96%. This is the sort of thing that econometricians die for. Right? This is a near perfect, it was an accident, I didn't expect it, it just came out. I'm not even going to stand by it and defend it, because I don't want some undergraduate to tell me I'm <laughs> But I will make my results, I will make my method and my data public, it is public, anybody can interrogate it. I've explained in great detail in my paper what the sources are. You can all reproduce this stuff, you can all test it, this is standard Galilean scientific, Popperian scientific method, you're welcome to do that. But all I'm saying is it's pretty good if I say so myself. But why does this matter? How long have I got? We're in the seventh year of this crisis. Now, you may think, hey, we've only been going for six years. But don't forget, the year after, you're in the first, you're in the second year. Okay, so just take it, we're in the seventh year. It's, it's the seventh birthday of the crisis, seventh birthday year. This is not a normal crisis. It's not a business cycle. It cannot just be a crisis of bad banking. It cannot, I would argue, just be the result of nationalisation on its own. It's certainly not, as we were told in 2009, a blip, which will soon be over. It's not a crisis of the capitalism that recovered in 2009. It's a continuation of that crisis. This is the conclusion that I draw. Why? Not because my version of the profit rate proves that the US economy is falling, but because that's the only prop left if you want to argue that it's falling. And I've just kicked that prop away. So you don't have any basis to argue that the US economy has been doing anything except declining continuously, since, as Robert Brenner has persistently and historically accurately argued, since the early 70s, probably the late 60s. Now, why is that uncomfortable, to, to borrow a phrase from Al Gore, why is this an uncomfortable truth? Because I don't think the left actually has a theory to explain this crisis, which is kind of embarrassing. And one of the reasons I've argued for some time now, the left has so little purchase, because you can talk about culture, and sociology, and politics, but Marx was an economic theorist. So if the Marxists can't offer an economic explanation of what's going on, you ain't got an explanation. You can build on that, superstructure, politics, anything you want, but if the, public, if the economic foundation is not there, it doesn't work. What have you got? What I call blip theories. This is a one-off event. Suddenly, American capitalists decided to gorge themselves on capital instead of investing. Um, recovery theories. Every Duminil levy. It was fine until 2007. Suddenly, a new crisis of neoliberalism. I not find that plausible. And people out there don't find it plausible. And what I call astrological theories. Now, this is a bit of knockabout. And I'm being unfair to some very serious theoreticians, but this is the long cycle, or the sequ sequence of hegemonies, or the sequence of structures of accumulation. What goes around comes around. If I was going to be very unkind, I would call the Mayan theories of capitalism. Wait till the 70-year cycle is over and the, the prayer wheel stops and then it'll all start up again. That's not plausible either. So it leads to ideas which I find simply not credible. It's not credible to say that capitalism has yet no real problems. The capitalists are basically happy. That doesn't work. The capitalism is doing too well for its own good, what I call overconsumption theories of capitalism. Many Marxists, particularly US Marxist theories of what's going on, is the capitalists are too rich. To explain that capitalism has problems because the capitalists are doing too well, it's kind of, you're going to have to do a bit of work before you make that theory stick. Or that the only problem is banking. Or that we just have to wait for the next hegemon. It doesn't work. So you have what I think Marx himself explained, a crisis of accumulation. A fundamental thesis of Marx, and 
Michael Heinrich has written a much talked about article in the latest edition of Marx Review, in which he says Marx has, no, Marx has no theory of crisis, and I know because I'm an erudite researcher, which he is, into what Marx wrote in volume three. But the problem is what Marx wrote in volume one, in the chapter on the tendency, the long run tendency of capitalism, the chapter where he actually sets out the law of motion of capitalism, more or less. He begins by saying the principal long term tendency of capitalism is the expansion of the constant element of capital in relation to the variable. That's his explanation. <coughs> that might translate as full of rate of profit, it might translate into the geopolitical problems that Radica has talked about. There's a whole variety of ways that can work out. But if you don't say at the heart of the problem is that capitalism needs to accumulate capital, but it cannot do that indefinitely, and therefore accumulation contradicts itself there are contradictions inherent to the capitalist mode of production. You have a lot of trouble, and the troubles get worse. And the rate of profit is nothing more than an index of that tendency, in my opinion. I don't attach any religious uh, merit to it. It's just a way of indicating that that's what's going on. They're accumulating capital. It's getting to the point where this means the individual rates of turn on small parts of that are so tiny that people are just going anywhere. As, as Radica described, anywhere in the world to put their money rather than actually make uh, productive investment. So you get a range of crisis tendencies. So you then get, last slide but one, um, you have what I call Marx, the spectre hunting, haunting Marxism, which is that between 1936 and 97, you have what I in a capital and class article called Marxism without Marx. People attempting to reproduce Marxist conclusions without using Marx's method. That blew up in 1979 with Stephen. And you now get the notion that Marxism can overturn Marx. Marx doesn't work. That's been pretty well refuted. People have basically don't try and argue that anymore. But what you get from here to here for the last 10 years is forget Marx. You don't need capitalism's recovery. Where have we reached now? Books. That's books. Crisis theory is in crisis. <laughs> so what can we agree on? Most basic. There is a long-term decline. It's rooted in accumulation. It's not going to restore itself. Marx has a legitimate account of it, not the only one, but you have to look at this accumulation process. Not nix it, say it's irrelevant, it's self-contradictory, anything like that. Just use it. You get something out of it. And it contains superior explanations to what Marx is to carry out. It's a very uncomfortable truth, but it is, you know? Without being religious about it. Now, finally, you can actually join this discussion if you think what I'm saying is dreadful, especially if you're watching the video and you get angry because you can't stick a hand up your chair which is that we're going to open the blog for the Journal of Australian Political Economy on May 15th. Everybody's welcome. Try to be constructive. You can't be constructive, you're reasonable. If you can't be reasonable, please don't ignore the facts. <laughs> <laughs>